ton of ground to cover, no time for chit chat, hello, good morning, all that boring stuff. Um, sorry, I'm task driven. Uh, Exodus 34, if you are new or visiting, last week we kicked off a brand new series right out of Exodus 34, 6, and 7, which is ground zero for a theology of God. It is the one and only place in all of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation that God describes himself. And in essence, in a paragraph, says this is what I'm like. And because of that, it's the most quoted verse, remember from last week, in the Bible, by the Bible, which is crazy to me. And uh, we're gonna get back to work in the series. As you know, we're kind of going line by line through Exodus 34, six and seven. Now disclaimer, before the next four hour teaching. <laughs> Just kidding, two hour teaching. Um, uh, this weekend is right on the edge of dry. It's gonna feel kind of lecture-esque um, because it's a worldview teaching more than a heart-stirring kind of teaching. That's next week. But please stay with me because this idea that I was exposed to about four or five years ago, uh, I started reading a guy by the name of Greg Boyd with a book called God at War that was kind of my first portal into this way of thinking about God and the universe. And to be honest, it really kind of reshaped the way that I view the world. And I think it has the ability to do the same for you, but stay with me because I'm going to take up 45 minutes before that makes sense, okay? Let's read the text. Let's start off by reading the text out loud. The words are up on the screens. Here we go. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The plan for the series, as you know, is to work through that paragraph line by line. Last week we covered Yahweh, which means this week we are going to cover Yahweh. Yahweh. <laughs> now, why? I've noticed... It's repeated, Yahweh, or the Lord, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and on down the list. Now, why is that? Um, in modern English, if, you wanna emphasize, if you're writing and you wanna emphasize a point, you italicize or underline or highlight. But in ancient Hebrew, if you want to emphasize a point, you what? You repeat. Yahweh, Yahweh is the author's way of saying, listen, slow down, take a step back, and think about the name of God in depth. I want you to think about yet another facet of the name of God or Yahweh or the Lord. Now, the question last week was, what is the meaning of the name Yahweh? The question for today is, why does God need a name in the first place? What's wrong with God? And why is it that God is almost never called God in the scriptures? Almost never. He's almost always called Yahweh Elohim or the Lord your God. My Bible right here, the NIV says, um, the Lord, the Lord, the gracious and compassionate God, but that's actually out of order. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim or the Lord, the Lord God, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger on down the list. Why is that? Why does God need a name? Short answer is because there are many gods. Turn over to Genesis 1, to the left in your Bible. If that does not pique your interest, whatever. Genesis 1, to the left. Um, we have a ton of ground to cover. If, uh, if that... Um, doesn't work for you. If you want to turn to each passage, well done, along with me. If not, no worries. Uh, the words are going to be up on the screens. Genesis 1, here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As you know from last week, the word God is what in Hebrew? No, the Lord is Yahweh. Well done. What is God? Anybody remember? Yeah, Elohim. Now, what you may or may not know, and Elohim is a title, remember that, like doctor or lawyer, it's not a name. But what you may or may not know is that Elohim 
is, can be singular or plural depending on context, meaning it can be translated God, capital G in English, or God's, lowercase g. Now it's God right here because the verb created is singular, and in Hebrew, the subject and the verb always agree in number. You don't need to remember that, there's no test at the end of today, all right? But the point is, the story starts off by saying there is one creator God, and Genesis 1, which is a 20-hour sermon, is, a, is written over against the backdrop of ancient Near Eastern writings about creation, um, like the Babylonian Enuma Elish, in which there are many gods who, in conflict with one another, kind of create the cosmos, but not in the Genesis 1 story. No, there is one creator God who spoke the universe into existence. But that said, there are many Elohim. Turn over to Exodus 12, to the right in your Bible. Exodus 12, you know the story. Israel is in slavery in Egypt, and Yahweh comes to the rescue via the 10 plagues. Now, what you may or may not know is that each one of the 10 plagues is directed at a specific deity in the Egyptian pantheon. For example, Amnon Ra was the kind of chief Egyptian god. He was the sun god, he, and he was king over all the other gods in the Egyptian pantheon. Now, what does Yahweh do? He blots out the what? The sun for three days, which is Yahweh's way of saying, stick it to the man, right? <laughs> I mean, it's Yahweh's way of saying, listen, Amnon Ra is not the king over all the other gods. I am. Now listen to what God says right here. Uh, Exodus 12, 12. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both of people and animals. And listen, I will bring judgment on all the, what? Gods or Elohim of Egypt because I am Yahweh. Fascinating. All we know right here is that Yahweh is at war with the Elohim or the gods of Egypt. In fact, all of the warfare that you read about in the Hebrew scriptures, all the violence, whatever that is going on with that, it's all set up over against the cosmic war between Yahweh and the Elo that's right, and the Elohim or the gods at war with the creator. Interesting. Um, turn over to Exodus 15, two or three pages to the right. Fast forward a few weeks to right after Yahweh defeated the gods of Egypt with the 10 plagues. And we pick up the story right after the Red Sea in a worship song, um, Exodus 15. And then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to Yahweh. I will sing to Yahweh for he is highly exalted. He is my Elohim or my God and I will praise him. My father's Elohim or God, and I will exalt him. And then listen, if you skip down to 11, the text says, who among the gods is like you, Lord? Interest. Who among the Elohim is like you, Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, and working wonders? Not only is Yahweh the king over all the other gods, because he defeated Amnon-Ra and the plagues, but on top of that, He's in a class all by himself. That's why he is the one and only Elohim deserving of worship. Think of all the language in the Psalms. Here are a few samples. There is none like you among the gods. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all what? Gods. Worship him, all you gods. Interesting. The psalmist is singing to the gods, hey, worship him, Yahweh, for you, Yahweh, are the most high. One of the names for God. Well, what does that mean, the most high? Over all the earth, you are exalted far above all gods. Let's keep reading. Turn three or four pages to the right to chapter 20. Are you awake? Yeah? Okay. Exodus 20, as you know, is the Ten Commandments, or in Jewish culture, the Ten Words, because the opening line is, and God spoke all these words, quote, I am Yahweh Elohim, right? That's the title used for God all over. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, here we go. First off, you shall have no other gods before me. 
Secondly, you shall not make for yourself an image or an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, Yahweh Elohim, or the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Notice um, there are two commands, not one. First command is what? Yep, have no other Elohim or gods before me. Second command, hey, don't make an image or an idol. Now, in the modern world, we collapse the first two commandments into one, right? We lump the gods in with the idols. And because of that, we think of the gods as non-entities, meaning not real. Think of the language of false gods, right? By that, we mean what? Yeah, not real gods, false, not real. Um, And that's true of idols, but idols and gods are not the same thing. Idols are a representation. The gods are the real thing. What a shadow is to a human being, an idol is to a god. Um, Idols are fake and dead. The gods are real and alive. And idols can't do anything. It's a statue. But the gods can The gods have power. The gods can speak, do signs, wonders, prophecy, healings, the miraculous. Think of the story in the Exodus of Moses and Aaron in the kind of Pharaoh's courtroom with the magicians who are kind of in contact with the gods of Egypt. Right, you remember that story? And Moses, you know, throws down his staff on the ground and the staff turns into a snake and the magicians do what? The exact same thing. Then Moses makes uh, the river turn into blood. They do the same. Then Moses makes frogs come out of the water. They do the same. And then Moses makes the dust into gnats. And the magicians can't do that. For whatever reason, gnats are a problem. I'm (laughs) I'm not sure why. But you can make frogs, but you can't make gnats. Seriously, come on. Get with the program. Um, But the 10 words in Exodus 20 take for granted, listen, that there are other gods. Do not worship other gods means what? Yeah, there are other gods. Don't worship the other gods. And because of that, Yahweh is jealous. He's jealous. Now, in context, that jealousy is a good thing. It's the way a mother is jealous for her children not to get involved with a drug dealer or whatever. In that way, Yahweh is jealous for Israel, the sons and daughters of God. Listen, don't get involved with the other gods. And that's unique to Yahweh. Remember, the ancient Near East is a polytheistic culture, worship of many gods. That was okay. The gods worship as many gods as you want. And that was fine with the gods as long as you pay your due. But not this God, not this creator God, not this Yahweh. He is a jealous God. Now keep reading. Turn over to 1 Kings 11 to the right in your Bibles. Fast forward a few hundred years. 1 Kings, First uh, and Second Samuel. 1 Kings 11, here's the story. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter or his wife. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. The Hittites are so hot. Um, (laughs) They were from nations about which Yahweh had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because, here's why, they will turn your hearts after their what? Gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. Now, I have an amazing wife, but keeping one wife happy is a full-time job. I mean, seriously, 700? This guy's supposed to be wise? He's an idiot, right? (laughs) And it comes as no surprise, the next line, his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives, now listen, turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to Yahweh, his Elohim, as the heart of David, his father, had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord, did not follow the Lord completely. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for his foreign wives, and the story goes 
upon. Notice the gods are called by name and nowhere does the text say they aren't real or they are false gods, meaning not real gods. No, Ashtoreth is the goddess, goddess of the Sid Sidonians, modern day Lebanon, it's about 30 miles south of Beirut. And uh, Moloch is the goddess of the Ammonites, modern day Jordan, what's the capital city of Jordan? Amon, right? There are gods in the story with power and authority, listen, over geographic regions and ethnic groups. Think of Deuteronomy 32, where Moses is saying at the end of the Torah that at the Tower of Babel, the nations, when the nations were divided, the nations were given over to the gods. Think of Daniel 10, where Michael, the archangel, is wrestling for three weeks in conflict at war with the prince of Persia. Not the lousy Disney movie from a year or two ago, all right? God bless Jake Gyllenhaal. But... Um, <laughs> but with a real spiritual being over the kingdom of Persia. And then after that is the, is the prince of Greece. Wow, interesting. Gods, real spiritual beings with power and authority over geographic regions and ethnic groups, what you and I call nations in the world today. Now, don't, please, please listen. Do not misunderstand me. I am not saying that America is a Christian nation and India or whatever is a pagan nation. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the world we live in is populated by real spiritual beings, some of whom have authority over geographic regions and ethnic groups. Um, I know I'm gonna step on toes and I'm sure I'm gonna get an email for this one, but why am I saying it then? Who, here we go. Um, <laughs> But you know, I've, like you, have been really disturbed by all the shootings over the last month. And I was struck, there were two this week, two. And I was struck by the first one, was it Monday, I think, um, the shooting in Colorado. It's strange to me that four of the worst shootings in US history have all been within a few square miles of each other. Starting with Columbine, then the theater shooting a few. Four of the worst, coincidence? Maybe, I'm a skeptic at heart, maybe. In fact, probably, yes. But maybe there is a God, there is a demonic being with a grip on that area. And he's malevolent and cruel and violent and evil. Maybe, I don't know. But I do know that in the city I live in and love and call home, there are neighborhoods where there is a spiritual presence and it's dark. There are times when I walk into a home in my neighborhood or I walk into a business or I turn down a street, something is there. You know that feeling? There's a record store I go to once in a while. I don't know why I go there. Every time I walk in, something is there. I mean, you walk through the door and the... Interesting, gods with power and authority. Now, if the language of gods makes you nervous, that's okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, modern kind of Christians in the West prefer the language of angels and demons. Uh, now there are two problems, that's okay, but there are two problems with that kind of language. First off, the language of angels and demons comes with all kinds of baggage from culture. Uh, by angels, people think of blonde Swedish supermodels, you know, <laughs> with a 10 foot wingspan. <laughs> right? And I'm sorry to break it to you, but every single angel in the Bible is male. I just ruined your Christmas decorations for next year. I'm sorry, all right? Um, and by demons, you know, we think of the cartoon character on the, you know, shoulder with the pitchfork or Will Ferrell on Saturday Night Live or whatever, right? I mean, that's how we think of angels and demons. But the second problem is that the language that is used by the biblical authors, at least in Hebrew, at least in Genesis to Malachi, is Elohim or the gods. And in the story of 1 Kings, Solomon's heart is turned away, not by a cartoon character on his shoulder, but by the gods. And notice in the story, turned away to evil. Um, on that note, turn to Psalm 82 to the right, right to kind of smack dab in the middle of the scripture, Psalm 82. Okay, this, this is going to blow your mind up. Um, gosh, I get excited about weird things. Um, <laughs> Psalm 82, 
is a weird text. Um, it starts off, a Psalm of Asaph, starts off by saying, God presides in, and my Bible says the great assembly. If you're reading the ESV, it's the divine council, which we think is a better way to translate the text. God presides in the divine council, which you read about right here, you read about in Job 1, you read about in 2 Kings, and it's all over the um, literature of ancient Mesopotamia. It's all over Greek mythology. Think of... um, what was that horrific movie a few years ago? Uh, Rise of the Titans. You know that weird genre of movies of like Greek and Roman mythology and hard rock music? It's really bad. Um, but you know there's that scene uh, with the gods, i.e. Liam Neeson and company, who are up in the heavens having a conversation about what to, and the earth is down below, about what to do on the earth, okay? That's the divine council. That's what it's called in Greek mythology. Now, the main difference between the divine council and kind of Greek mythology and Hebrew, God bless you, um, you know, which comes from the German Gesundheit, which is, which is what you would say because they thought a demon was leaving your body, which is great news for you right now. Anyway, um, but... <laughs> That was great, yeah. Um, <laughs> but the main difference between Greek, <laughs> between Greek mythology and Hebrew theology is that in Hebrew theology, Yahweh is over the divine council. Read the text. God presides uh, in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. Now, my Bible puts it in quotes. In Hebrew, there's no such thing. If you're reading the ESV or the New American Standard, it says rulers. That's flat out wrong. In Hebrew, it's Elohim presides in the great assembly. He renders judgments among the Elohim. What the heck? God renders judgments among the gods. Then listen to what God, Yahweh, the creator, says to the gods in the divine council. Quote, How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Fascinating. What are the gods doing? Injustice. And Yahweh is saying, stop. Knock it off. Stop the injustice, the violence, the abuse, the robbery, the theft, the natural disasters, the oppression, the slavery, the brokenness, stop, knock it off. And he goes on to say, the gods know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are shaken. Meaning the gods are wreaking havoc on planet earth via injustice. I said, you are gods, you are all sons of the most high. Meaning you were all created by the most high, the creator God. But you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. You're going down. Right on the horizon for you is demise and defeat. And then the last line is a prayer. This is Asaph's prayer. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. All the nations that at the Tower of Babel were given over to the gods, who are now, rather than working for shalom over the earth, are rather wreaking havoc and injustice on the earth. God, please stop. Rise up and judge. That word judge in Hebrew means put the world to right. It's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on which side you're on right? Judge the earth. Rise up. It's a prayer for God to judge the gods. Now, on that note, turn to Jesus. Turn to Mark. um, Let's go Mark 5. Jesus comes as the answer to Asaph's prayer. Rise up, O God. Judge the earth. Enter Jesus. And the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are filled with stories about Jesus at war with demonic beings. Here's one, Mark 5. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Yeah, turn there. If you have a Bible, turn because it's kind of longer. Turn. Uh, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Now, um, the Gerasenes are outside of Israel, 
okay? This is in kind of modern day Damascus. Um, this is in kind of a pagan nation. When he got out of the boat, a man of an impure spirit came. This man lived in the tombs or in a cemetery. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart, broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. He's cutting. And if you have family or friends involved with that, it's dark. It's not always demonic, but it can be right here. We have a man outside Israel tormented by a demon. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran, fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want to do with me, Jesus? Notice, son of what? The most high God. In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. Legion was a Roman military unit with up to 5,000 soldiers. He begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Interesting geographic areas. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. I have no clue what's up with that. Um, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and committed pigicide, right? <laughs> and into the lake, and on a serious note, we're drowned. That is the dark kingdom's agenda to run the world into the ground. The language of Jesus to steal and kill and what? And destroy. And here is a glimpse of Jesus at war with the demonic kingdom. And notice with power and with the Authority. The kingdom is scared to death of Jesus, the son of the most high God. One more, turn over to Ephesians 6, a few pages to the right. This, by the way, is the edited version. You don't think that's funny, okay? Um, <laughs> Ephesians 6 is, as you know, a letter written by Paul to the church in the city of Ephesus, which is uh, a city given over to the worship of the gods, where real spiritual beings, um, I mean, the, the city's filled with temple after temple after temple, and people are connected um, not to the one true creator God, but to the gods, and listen to Paul's language, Ephesians 6, let's start off in 10. Finally, here's the last thing in the letter, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, Put on the full armor of God, kind of imagery, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That's a whole other sermon. Um, the devil is a malicious God over all the other spiritual beings in the dark world. He's called by Paul and Jesus, the God of this world. And right here he's called the devil. For, here's why, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Do you forget that? I do all the time. Our struggle is not against a nation or an ethnicity or your boss or a political group. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now notice there is all sorts of language used by the biblical authors, uh, rulers, authorities, power, spiritual forces of evil, principalities, princes, spirits, angels, demons, and gods. The language is ambiguous. We think the gods are powerful spiritual beings with authority over kind of nations and the demons are lower level spiritual beings who work for the gods. That's kind of theory, but we kind of, that's the consensus. But whether or not that is true, we know for sure that the, um, that the biblical authors are all making the same point. There is, listen, there is one creator God who made the universe, who spoke all that is real into existence. But there is a multiplicity of created gods or real spiritual beings. Think of them as lesser gods or in the language of Gary Brashear's, gods with a lowercase g. And these gods have a measure of free will and autonomy just like human beings. 
They can obey God and serve God, or they can rebel and fight God. Some love God, others hate God, some are good, others are evil. But the fact is, there is an invisible world all around you that is just as real as the visible world. Now, the majority of you don't buy that. I don't buy that half the time. Or we're Western Europeans. We're educated. We have access to Wikipedia. <laughs> Come on, right? And that's not how we think. Even followers of Jesus, for the most part, are what my friend Gary calls functional materialists. Sure, you believe in God. Maybe you believe he's involved in human history. Maybe not. For sure, you think he's a Republican, but other than that, you're kind of not sure, <laughs> right? Um, maybe you believe in angels and demons, maybe, on a good day. But we want to think that all the demonic powers that we read about from cover to cover in the scriptures retired in AD 70 and moved to Indonesia, right? <laughs> but that is flat out not true. The reality is, is that you and I have been deeply shaped by Western European culture, by the Enlightenment, um, by kind of the elevation of the mind by scientism. No, not science, we're fans of science, like in, by, in droves. Scientism is a worldview, um, or some call it a religion, um, that in essence is deeply embedded in Western culture, that in essence says all that is real is what you can put under a microscope in a laboratory. That's all, that is. Everything else is superstitious nonsense. And the majority of the world um, kind of looks at the West and thinks that's stupid. That is, seriously? That, you, you make sense of the world with that worldview? That's ridiculous. Um, but that is what, for the most part, we believe in the West. Now, here's the problem. That, I would argue, is not the worldview of Jesus, and it's not the worldview of the biblical authors. Um, there are three worldviews that I bump into all the time in the city of Portland. There are way more kind of across the globe, but three that I bump into all the time if you're taking notes. The first, next slide, um, is kind of monothe monotheism. Um, and it's the idea, and you know the idea well, that there is one God, and kind of the imagery of a mountain, right? God's at the top of the mountain, and Jesus is how you get to God. And all the other gods in the major world religions, and Islam, and Hinduism, and all that stuff, are false gods. And by that, the majority of Western Europeans mean non, kind of non-entities. I would argue that worldview is actually not the worldview of Jesus. Um, the second worldview I bump into all the time is uh, kind of universalism, which is a junk drawer title. I apologize for that. I see it all the time in Portland. I see it all over the place in my generation. And it's the idea that there is one God. Um, we're not really sure what God is like. He's out there somewhere in the universe. Or maybe it's a she or they or an it or a state of being, or a nirvana, or I don't really know for sure. But it's the idea that puts simply all paths lead up the same what? Mountain. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, Wicca, spirituality, which is kind of the religion of the day, Judaism, Baha'i, Jesus, you know, kind of all paths lead up the same mountain. Now this view sounds nice, right? I really like this view. I would love for this to be true. It would make my job so much easier. Um, this view sounds polite. If you actually know the origin of this view, it's not at all. It's, it's nothing of the sort. This view was born out of Western European imperialism right around the turn of the 19th century. Western Europeans, um, who at the most part were ex-followers of Jesus, who were deists um, with a faith in God, but not a God that we know as Jesus of Nazareth, not a God with his fingers in the human story, a God who is kind of out there somewhere else. And these kind of men and women started conquering the world, and in doing so, were exposed to all sorts of spirituality, animism in Africa, Islam in the Middle East, um, Hinduism in uh, all over India, Buddhism in Japan, ancestor worship in China, all that stuff. And they started saying, well, you know, there are similarities in all the world religions right? All the major world religions. Uh, and that's true. For sure there are similarities between the teachings of Jesus and, say, the Buddha. Absolutely there are similarities between the Old Testament and Islam, for sure. But there are chasmic differences. And the problem is that none of the people who were conquered 
agree with this theory. <laughs> None of them think that. They don't think, oh yeah, Jesus and Allah are kind of saying the same thing. They don't think that. Are you out of your mind? No, they think there's a war on. They, they, they don't think that at all. That view was imposed on them through cultural imperialism by the West. What they think, what they believe for the most part, is that there are different gods. And the reality is that there are different people all around the world worshiping different gods, which leads me to the worldview of Jesus and the scriptures. Next slide. Uh, the technical title in theology is creational monotheism, and it's the idea that there's not one mountain, there's many. And uh, Allah, I'm sorry, Islam is the way to Allah, and Buddhism is the way to Nirvana, and Hinduism is the way to the Brahman, and Mormonism is the way to Elohim. Interesting, that's the Mormon title for God. And you have Wicca, and you have spirituality, and that's a sample. I mean, you literally have however many dozens of mountains with dozens of gods and world religions and spirituality that is set up as the way to the gods. But next slide, there is one creator God who made all the others, who spoke the universe into existence. He's called Yahweh in the Hebrew scriptures, or what you and I call the Old Testament. He's called God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in the writings of the New Testament. And this God, next slide, is nothing like the others. This God comes down the mountain in Jesus. He comes down the mountain in the incarnation of Jesus of Nazareth. It's not that all paths lead up the same mountain, universalism. It's that there are different paths up different mountains. And it's not that Jesus is the only way to God, monotheism. He, he is, don't get me wrong, he is. But it's more like he is God come to us. Get the difference. He is Yahweh, Think back to last week. The creator of the universe, born in flesh and blood. He is Yahweh, come to you and me. That is the gospel of Jesus. And that, I would argue, is the worldview of Jesus and the scriptures. Now, I'm well aware uh, that if you're not a follower of Jesus, this may be borderline offensive to you. And that is not my heart at all. Um, I don't want to continue in that cultural imperialism, uh, much less religious imperialism. And if you are a follower of Jesus, but like me, you have been deeply shaped by Western culture, this may uh, sound jarring to you, but stay with me um, because there are profound and far-reaching implications for how we think about um, three or four things, if you're taking notes. First off, um, here we go. There are implications for how we think about the gospel. We live in a city that is self, and I'm a part of a generation, that is self-identified as spiritual, but not religious, right? People say to me all the time, I don't go to church, but I'm what? Spiritual. spiritual. You get that? I get that all the time, right? That's okay, valid. The follow-up question to that said, nice, is uh, okay, with what spirit? Because there are, there are many. You're spiritual. Okay. With what spirit? Who are you kind of in relationship with? There's the Holy Spirit, which is language used by Jesus, for the spirit of Yahweh. But then there's the spirit of you fill in the blank. People say all the time, ah, Jesus, I'm not sure about Jesus, but I believe in God. What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, God is not a common denominator. Oh, you believe in God. Oh, okay. That is not a common denominator. What do you mean? Which one? You believe in God? Which one? He, she, it, they, state of being? The one you made up in your own head? Yep, that one. He's awesome. <laughs> like, which, which one? I was driving with my son, Jude, yesterday, and uh, we passed by one of his friend's house who's Jewish, and he said, oh, that's my friend, so-and-so. He just finished Hanukkah or whatever. And I said, is he a follower of Jesus? I was asking, and he said, oh, he believes in the Lord. I said, oh, dang it. Well, that's not the same thing. I mean, it kind of is, but, well, he reads the Bible. Well, yeah, but what he means by that is the first part, not the second part, not... Try that on a seven-year-old, right? <laughs> well, the history goes back to the first century, and the... 
God is not a common denominator anymore. It's interesting. All that I'm saying is, my friends, when you're with family and friends and people that you love and you care about, introduce people to Jesus. Because in Jesus, God comes down the mountain and says, come and follow me. And this God that we see in Exodus 34, that we see in Jesus, that we see in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, he's nothing like the others. He's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and mercy, and on down the list. And this God we see in Jesus. Now secondly, there are implications for how we think about evil. Please listen. One of, if not the question in the West about God is kind of if there's a God and he's all loving and all powerful, why is there evil in the world? In theology, it's called theodicy or the problem of evil. Um, And it's the root cause of unbelief for literally millions of Americans. I cannot tell you how many people I talk to who don't buy the gospel of Jesus because of that. If there's a God, if he's all loving, if he's all powerful, you say, I don't buy that. Why is there evil in the world? Now, what's striking to me is that the scriptures say little or nothing about the problem of evil. And it's a long book. (laughs) The closest thing you get is Job, but that is more about justice than about the problem of evil. Not one of the New Testament authors are wrestling with the problem of evil. Why? Because in the world view of the ancient Near East, of the first century, and of all the biblical authors, evil is a problem, but it's not a philosophical problem. It's a, it's a problem in real life. Because evil is assumed. It's assumed that the universe is filled with real spiritual beings. Some are good, others are evil, and planet Earth is, for lack of a better analogy, the site of a war. That is a worldview assumed by Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Paul and Peter and on down the list. The problem is that is no longer the worldview of the West. And when we lost the biblical worldview, one creator God, many created gods, quite a few of whom are at war with the creator God and wreaking havoc on the earth. When we lost that worldview, we lost a biblical answer to the problem of evil. Um, Greg Boyd writes, next slide, when one possesses a vital awareness that in between God and humanity, there exists a vast society of spiritual beings who are quite like humans in possessing intelligence and free will, there is simply no difficulty in reconciling the reality of evil with the goodness of the supreme God. It virtually sidesteps the problem of evil. Now by that he means philosophically because you stop wrestling with evil philosophically in your head and with your professor and you start praying against evil. You stop questioning God about evil and you start fighting shoulder to shoulder with God the evil in the world. Does that make sense? But to get there, you need a worldview like that of Jesus. Third, if you're taking notes, there are implications for how we think about about spirituality, which is a positive word, right? I'm spiritual, right? Okay, great, I am too. Um, and the majority of you are not involved at all in the occult or Wicca or tarot cards or palm readers, right? But it's all over the place. And I think it goes without saying, stay away from that stuff because it's real. Stay away from anything that is a portal for the demonic. And and not only the occult stuff, um, drugs, obviously, as you all know, it can be a portal for the demonic. Perverted sexuality can be. And not just abuse and stuff like that, pornography absolutely can be a way that you open up your life to the influence of demonic power. Uh, There's a line in Ephesians that says bitterness can be a portal, right? There's that line, uh, do not let the sun go down on your anger and in doing so give the devil a foothold. Holy cow. How is that for a motivation to forgive your father? Because if you don't, you actually open the door and give a demonic being with power and authority a foothold in your life, in your head, in your heart, in your future, in your story. Stay away from that stuff. Um, I got an email a while back from a gal whose friend, who's all distraught because her friend went to a palm reader and the palm reader was able to tell the future. A few weeks later, what she said out of the blue happened. And this gal, who's a follower of Jesus, did not have a category for that. She's a monotheist. 
One God, everything else is a sham. Uh, and what's a palm reader? It's either a con artist or it's a man or a woman who is connected with a God, with a demonic power. And she did not have a category for that. The reality is that stuff can be, it's not always, but can be real. Stay away from all that. The reality is that demonic spirits are not bound to time and space the same way that we are and can do signs, wonders, healings, prophecy, the miraculous, all that stuff. Watch out. There are implications for how we think about spirituality. And then last, um, there are implications for how we think about idolatry. On one hand, like I said before, idols are not real. They are made out of wood and stone. Um, but on the other hand, Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 10 that at the back of an idol, there can be a real spiritual being drawing you away from the worship of the Most High God. And keep in mind that idolatry in the scriptures is more than the worship of a statue. It's giving your life away to anything other than God. And by God, I mean Yahweh, the God who spoke the universe into existence. Um, money can be an idol, as you know. Success can be an idol. Romance, beauty, on down the list. And I think of John, at the end of his life, um, if you know the author John in the New Testament, we read 1 John, which was written, we think, in John's 90s. He's the last living disciple of Jesus. Um, and the last words out of John's mouth are, and closing line of 1 John, little children, keep yourselves from idols. An elderly man, after decades with Jesus, little children, here's the last thing I have to say. Keep yourselves from idols. Um, to end, where are you at? You, as a human being, whether you're religious or an atheist or anywhere in between, you were created to worship. And you do worship the same way that you breathe. You're human. Um, you might not think of yourself that way, but you do. The question is not, do you worship, but what do you worship? What do you give your life away to? We all worship, some people worship God and Jesus, other people worship the gods, other people worship success or money or fame or whatever. Um, and here's how you tell. What do you make sacrifices for? We want to think that the sacrifices we read about in kind of the Old Testament and kind of in the developing world are a pre-modern thing. But keep in mind that animals in the ancient world were currency over time. It's money, it's investments. Hmm. You're telling me that when somebody drops 85 grand on a car, that has nothing to do with worship? No, if that's how much your car costs, please let me borrow it and don't walk out, all right? <laughs> um, but that can be worship. It's money. It's sacrifice over time. Um, what do you spend your money on? What do you spend your time on? Where do you go for an escape? Hmm. When you're depressed, when you're tired, when you're down after a long day, where do you go? A glass, a bottle, a TV show? a website, a relationship, a gym, a habit. It can be good, it can be bad. Where do you go for an escape? Or here's another way. Um, what are you scared of? What is there that if you lost, it would be the end? Right there, that's it. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Or, in the words of Jesus, love Yahweh your Elohim. Love the Lord your God with how much of your heart? All. All. And how much of your soul? All. And how much of your mind? All. And how much of your strength? All. All, with every scrap of who you are. Because in Jesus is life.